Praise the Lord and a very good evening to you. Thank you for joining us once again for another episode of the Bible study. Today we'll be looking at Ezekiel chapter number 28. My name is Pastor Tim Wangi. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father and our Lord, we bless you and we thank you as we come to the end of the judgment concerning the entire city and also now the king. We pray that you will illuminate your light of revelation so that we can get the context and the text and appreciate every lesson that we can learn from this particular reading. Let your name be glorified and let your name be edified. And it is in Jesus' name that we have prayed and believed. Amen and amen. So tonight we'll be looking at a very important topic. Um, Ezekiel 28 is a highly quoted chapter, especially when people talk about Lucifer. Uh, but it is, it's, it's one of the most, part of, uh, part of very debatable texts in scripture, but I believe the Holy Spirit will give us insight even as we read about it. Let's look at it. This is proclamation against the king of Tyre. The word of the Lord came to me again saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, that says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God's in the midst of the seas. Yet you are a man and not a God, though you set your heart as the heart of a God. Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom in trade, you have increased your riches, and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Therefore, thus says the, the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom, and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit, and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. Will you still say before him who slays you, I'm a god? But you shall be a man and not a god in the land of him who slays you. You shall die the death of uncircumcised by the hand of aliens, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. Um... Let's first of all deal with that pattern, part because um, it is in, in different parts and then we'll be able to appreciate uh, the book of Ezekiel chapter number 28. So we are moving from Ezekiel 26 whereby we saw the pronunciation of judgment over the city of Tyre and the waves of judgment that were going to come upon the city. And then we came to Ezekiel 27 where the city of Tyre is signified and symbolically portrayed as a ship that is of excellent architectural design with a lot of sophisticated military uh, kind of defense and also typified with wealth, glamour, and also majesty. And also we saw that the kind of networks and businesses that the city was doing with nations globally. And now we come to the king or the ruler of that particular city. And when we come to the first face, it is a description of this kind of demigod. A demigod is a person who was human but was believed to carry some deity dimensions. Um, so, 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 so first of all, we begin to see that there is judgment over the city. And already the judgment has already been pronounced. Probably the king being addressed here is King Edbal II. The king Edbal or Etobal II or Etobalas, according to historical writing. That when we parallel the timing when this particular prophecy came, uh, the king that was in power that time was King Etbal II. And so we begin to see that there is direct announcement of judgment 
over this particular character and this particular personality. And so, um, uh, son of man said to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted, remember the sin of the city was because of pride. They had material splendor, riches, wealth. They had a system of defense. And they were popular according to their strategic position, being a marine city, doing business by the sea. Um, the wealth upon the city was so much. And so this not only translated into pride to the people that lived in Tyre, but this looks like even from the top, their pride was also there. They say naturally, fish begins to rot from the head. The leadership already was in trouble. And there was pride that was found in the heart. And you say, I am a God. You say, I am a God. Now, in the culture of the day, one of the things that helps us to understand ancient biblical literature is what we call the history of the ancient Near East people, the history of the ancient Near East people. Uh, these are the people who lived in the biblical age. When we begin to understand their history, understand their traditions, and understand their cultures, some of the biblical writings become very practical because the literature was written in a certain setting, in a certain time, certain setting, and certain ideological and, you know, ideological setting, how people viewed life in a certain level and a certain lenses. So at this time, when we go to the setting of the day, um, uh, what used to happen is that the, the, the Asian Near Easterners often viewed their kings as the embodiment of their gods. And so we can literally get why this king was trying to comment whatever he's commenting. The people viewed kings as embodiment of gods. And to some level, kings were given worship. You remember in the days of Daniel when there was a law and the law was let everybody worship the king in the next 30 days. That was the law because the mindset of the people is that kings were physical embodiments of deities. And so at this hour, because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am a god. I sit, uh, I, I, I sit in the seat of God. Uh, so this one, of course, now going again to the literature, uh, we begin to see, when you go to the history of the people of Tyre, uh, there were many deities being worshipped in that particular city, and there were many seats that were given to those deities. Um, and so many kings looked themselves as gods, and possibly they had a place where they would sit, and they possibly even it got in the mind of this king that he must have been that deity that people thought about. Yet you are a man and not a god, though you set your heart as the heart of a god. Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. This is very powerful. Uh, that the prophet acknowledges that this particular king is wiser than Daniel. Daniel was considered to be one that in the ancient Babylonian setup, Daniel was known to be the wisest, who knew the secrets that even the people did not know. Two instances when the king had a dream and he, he demanded that all the wise men give him the dream and the interpretation. And there was no wise man in Babylon that could do that assignment. But Daniel came and through the system of prayer uh, got the dream of the king and even the interpretation. And as if that was not enough, in later years when Belshazzar was the king of Babylon after Nebuchadnezzar had died, a hand showed up while they were indulging uh, by using the vessels of the temple. A hand showed up, and when the hand showed up, it wrote on the wall, and they didn't know what it meant. And the mother of Nebuchadnezzar said to Belshazzar that you need to console Daniel because the spirit of the Holy God is in him. And in the days of your father, he interpreted and gave him the dream. So we begin to see that this matter's wisdom was not academically connected. These had to be men that had certain rankings in the spirit to decode certain truths and realities. 
And so he says, you know, the man was wiser than Daniel, meaning that this king must have had very detailed and technical spiritual dealings. Now, for me, what caught my attention, <coughs> what caught my attention, sorry, is what is mentioned after that. Behold, you are wiser than Daniel, meaning that there is a detail of spiritual intelligence that you have. Daniel's intelligence was out of access through the channels of prayer. But this particular king looks like there are things, there are details of spiritual truths and reality that are known to him. Of course, as we go to the next chapter, uh, I mean the next verse and the next segment, we'll begin to understand the duality of conversation that is taking place here. And there, there is no secret that can be hidden from you. With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. When I read this part of scripture, I really, uh, I really, it, it really stuck my, 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 my spirit in a very deep way. That when we look at Solomon, the man that even today, Forbes magazine, and the richest people, no man has matched the wealth of Solomon. Because scripture is clear that in the days of Solomon, gold was like dust. That was the intensity of his wealth. So when we look at even economists that measure their wealth with gold bars, we cannot compare what Solomon was commanding versus the wealth. And we see that the secret of Solomon was wisdom. Uh, the Lord said, you have asked for the right thing, and because you've not sought for anything materialistic, I will give you wisdom. But above all, also riches and honor will be a part of you. What I've discovered consistently with the pattern of Scripture is that wisdom is the trigger of wealth. Wisdom is the trigger of wealth. But when I begin to read Ezekiel 28, it is beyond what I call book wisdom. There must be a spiritual understanding, operation, and, you know, growth that ushers men to dimensions of wisdom. When you look at, uh, someone told me, it's very hard to find men that have broken realms of being billionaires who are not believers. It's very hard to find people that have broken the billionaire rank and they don't believe. The point there is that they, they believe in spiritual dimensions and some of them operate from detailed wisdom from a darkness dimension. And so this king had wisdom and he was wiser than Daniel. This is the Bible saying that this particular king was wiser than Daniel, that there is no secret that could be hidden from you with your wisdom and your understanding. That's why we have no other we have no other way of survival as believers but to walk in understanding of spiritual truths. That is our secret. That is our secret to enter into wealth and abundance. With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. So we see that this becomes a very pivotal thing when it comes to working in wealth. By your great wisdom in trade, you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because you have riches. Of course, we know that uh, the Asian Tyre was known as an economic hub. We saw in chapter number 26 the kind of collusions and collisions that uh, the city of Tyre had with all these nations and the trade that they used to have, the suppliers of tin, suppliers of wine, suppliers of meat, suppliers of uh, saddles, horses of war. We, we see that there was a very great commerce and we begin to see it was also because of the wisdom that the king carried. Naturally, the success of a nation is basically tied to the wisdom of that, I mean the strength and the leadership of the person that was following. Therefore, thus says the Lord, because you have set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations. The judgment coming upon Tyre was because of two things. One, because they enjoyed when Israel was attacked, and two, there was pride. Now, the judgment upon the king of Tyre is because of his heart was lifted 
and he was playing God. And he was playing God. And so remember, the judgments of all these nations that were next to Israel was evangelism. The Lord was vindicating himself as the ruler and as the Lord among all the nations. The second thing is fulfillment of prophecy because the Lord promised that he is going to deal with the enemies of Israel. When he spoke uh, to, to Abraham, he said, you know, and the enemies, your enemies shall be my enemies. So anyone who rose as an enemy of Israel automatically created an environment for judgment. And this is very serious when we look at it. So we begin to see that pride, pride, and that pride is what made uh, this particular king to exalt himself and even to play the concept of deity. And then the details of the judgment are explained, and they shall draw their sword against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the sea. You have exalted yourself as a god. Gods don't die, but you will die the death of a man. This is exactly what the text is trying to talk about. And, and, um, and, 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 and this has to be well understood. And the Lord also gives that the king not only will he die, but he was going to die a very shameful death. Will you still say before him who slay you, I am a god, but you shall be a man and not a god in the hand of him who slays you. You shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of aliens, for I have spoken, says the Lord. Uh, the people of that community used to circumcise. And so dying the death of uncircumcised is literally saying your death shall be a very shameful death. That's exactly what the Lord is trying to say. Pride made this king exalt himself and place himself in the level of gods and even wanted to, he had his seats among the populace and the Lord is now moving, cleansing the city of Tyre and he has to deal with the leaders of Tyre because of pride and exalting themselves. Actually, the Bible says, uh, you know, the, the Lord will always resist the proud and the Lord will always humble the proud. This pattern is very key. When Nebuchadnezzar stood and said, am I not the one who has built all these kingdoms with my own ability and hand? The Bible says at that hour, he began to behave like an animal. He stayed in the forest for seven years. His paws grows and hair grew all over like an animal. This was a superpower. And when you read the book of Daniel, the deliverance of Nebuchadnezzar was when he acknowledged that God is the only, the Lord is the only God and is worthy to be worshipped. And many people believe Nebuchadnezzar died a converted man, a superpower, radical, inhuman, all these kind of characteristics, but later was humbled by God because, you know, there is no other God in heaven. And, and that man, with the intensity of idols in Babylon, acknowledged that indeed God is God above all the other lords. Now, the, second, the portion of scripture I'm about to read is a little bit very, uh, very debatable because of what we call the context and the text. But uh, we, we appreciate um, early theological fathers for laying a foundation and building it up and straight up. So the second part of scripture will begin to see that um, there is duality of speech and there is parallelism of kings. And I'll explain what that means. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You are the seed of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You are in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You are the anointed cherub who covers. I established you, you are on the holy mountains of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery storms. 
You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You are corrupt. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities. By the iniquity of your trading, therefore I brought fire from your midst and devoured you. And I turned you to ashes upon the earth is the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the people are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Now, Ezekiel 28, beginning from verse 11 going down, is basically agreeable by many theologians and scholars that the description of the king here is not the description of the first king. And this is considered as the description of Lucifer. Now, this is it. This is a parallel conversation. The Lord looks like he's rebuking the king. But of course, the founder of the city of Tyre and the forces that were ruling the city of Tyre was beyond the physical king. There was a force behind the throne of the king. And that force must have been the force of Lucifer. So not only is the judgment coming upon the king, but the judgment is also being extended to the ruler and the ruling power that is controlling Tyre. And now this begins now to bring the parallelism that it looks like God is speaking to one king, but when you begin to enter into the prophetic analysis, you discover there is duality of speech and duality of judgment. And that's why now, even when we go from the former chapter, it is easy to understand that we are not just talking about one king. We are talking about a king physically on the throne, but we are also talking about the forces that enthrone the one that is on the throne. So there is judgment of the physical king, but there is also pronouncement of judgment of the forces that establish the very foundations of the city of Tyre. And so this is believed to be judgment over now the force that is behind the king. Now that begins to open up and tell you why then this king was wiser than Daniel. Because the king was being inspired by a force that existed and has intelligence of eternity. Because the devil lived and understands the realm of the spirit and the devil understands God. So if this king was inspired by the devil, there must be dimensions of wisdom that the devil understands about the realm of the spirit where he has operated from and even about God that even some, some people in our realm may not understand because of where he stood and the rank that he had in the spirit. So let us begin to dissect this scripture. Uh, take up a lamentation. Anytime a lamentation is always a funeral song or a funeral dodge. And any time there is a funeral song, it means judgment has already been announced. Take up a lamentation and say to him, you are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. It is agreeable that even the original name was not Satan. The original name was not the dragon or the serpent. The original name of the devil was Lucifer. In fact, that name devil is an adopted name that was adopted from the Greek translations because in Greek mythology, the darkest and the most evil forces of the demonic was called the devil. So this name Satan and the devil uh, came later, but the original name of the devil in glory was Lucifer, and he was also called the light bearer. Um, extra biblical text uh, you know, cite and say there was a lot of, there was proximity of Lucifer to the throne. And he was a magnificent creature. The details of his creations have been detailed in some, some of the writings, though not majority of them. And this is one of them. And, and so we begin to see one, um, he was the seal of perfection. Allow me to say this. I know we have always portrayed the devil as a very ugly being, but when we look from the scriptural rendering, 
This, must, this might not be the ugly thing we might be seeing. The things he did were ugly. And whatever power he operates with is ugly. But when we look at this, uh, it's a different story. You are full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You are in Eden, the garden of God. We know that when Adam and Eve were planted in the garden, the temptation of, the, the temptation of man took place in Eden. And in fact, they say, and these are extra biblical writings, they say that Lucifer was in Eden before even man showed up. He was in Eden before even Adam and Eve showed up. And, and you know, uh, 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 it's, it's clear because the temptation happened in Eden, meaning that he was in Eden. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond. Beryx, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes uh, were prepared for you on the day you were created. Um, and I know when we look at this chapter number 13, uh, we begin to see that even when the high priest was supposed to go and do business, he had to go with the, with the breastplate, and that breastplate uh, was covered with very expensive stones. And also there were some stones also on his shoulders. And th this is, now we are looking at a being whose image is full of these very precious stones uh, upon him. And, and, and you know the concept, that there were 12 stones on the, on the breastplate of the, of the priest he used to tie it uh, 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 as, a, as, a, as part of an effort used to tie it and then there were two, or, uh, two stones, I mean stones on the shoulders and all that. And also in the Asian culture, kings would wear robes that were made of these very precious stones just as a sign of majesty and, and, and beauty for them. But because we are not looking at a physical king or a physical ruler, we begin to see that these were the details of his preparation. And this is now the details of the beauty that was upon Lucifer when he was still a serving angel. And they, they say here, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipe was prepared for you on the day you were created. Now, this workmanship of timbrels and pipes, the, the wording here is musical instruments, the string instruments and the wind instruments, the flutes, the tambourines, the, the saxophone, these are the wind instruments. And the scripture here declares like they were, part, they were part of him. This is a mystery because it means as the Lord created Lucifer, in him were these uh, musical or these instruments, the timbrels and the pipes. And it is out of this scripture that men have always assumed that Lucifer was a praise and worship leader. Listen, there is nowhere in the Bible where it records that there is a team that leads worship in heaven. <laughs> there is nowhere. All we know is that there are, we have the, seraphi the, 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 the seraphims who surround the throne of God and they declare holy, holy. Now, when we look at the ranking that is given here, you are the anointed cherub who covers. That language there, covers, means uh, you had a rank among the cherubims. When you look at the seraphims, the fiery ones, their work is to guard the throne. The cherubims, their work was to protect the holiness of God, and they moved in the direction of the throne. We saw this when we began Ezekiel chapter number one, because we saw the description of the cherub. So if Lucifer was a covering cherub, then he must be doing business from a dimension of consecration, whereby he understood and he understood that sin is the only thing can hinder men from worshiping and serving God. And that's why this must be well understood because as a cherub, he had the revelation of holiness and the standards of God's holiness. So, so being a covering cherub, he understood very deep truths about the standards of God's holiness. And being a leader among those who are covering, he must have understood all this. So the concept of him being a worshiper cannot be scripturally 
verified. But this is what we call speculations. Because people believe because there were these uh, instruments in him, then he must have been a little bit conversant with worship and glory. What I know from scripture, every angelic rank and every angelic beings worship according to their rank and the revelation of their rank. For the seraphims, they declare holy. For the hosts of heaven, their greatest declaration is hallelujah, which is praise the Lord. For the elders is worthy, is the Lamb. Of course, they are not angels. But when we look at the utterances that are captured in scripture, you discover according to the revelation of their interaction with God, that revelation dictates what we might call their worship or adoration to God. And anyway, I don't want to go to that, but of course we know sound is ancient and music is ancient and very powerful. Uh, so it continues here, you are the anointed cherub who covers, I established you, you are on the holy mountain of God, you walked back and forth in the midst of fiery storms. You are perfect in your ways from the days you were created Till iniquity was found in you. You were perfect in your days until the day. So, you know, he walked in the presence of God. He enjoyed the presence. There was proximity to the throne of Elohim before iniquity. Now, what we need to get here is that there was no action. The devil never acted. There was no action in heaven. The devil never rebelled. He didn't even set his throne as he has desired. But in his heart, the motive was compromised. And this is why those who've taken time to study uh, in geology, the study of angels, they believe that angels have a free will and angels have the power of decision. Because there are those who followed Lucifer, meaning that they have a free will and they have the power of decision. And there was a wrong motive in the heart of Lucifer. When you go to Isaiah chapter number, I believe is it 12, uh, beginning from verse 14, should be Isaiah chapter number 12, uh, beginning from verse 14, we begin to see the I wills, the five I wills of Lucifer. Isaiah 12. Is it 14? Oh, Isaiah 14, 12. Yeah, 14, 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, this is Isaiah 14 from verse 12. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. These were the motives. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. So he had a throne as a covering cherub. He had a rank. Um, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. These were the desires and the motives in the heart of Lucifer. And God, we know God is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. He is all-knowing. The all-knowing God could not wait for the action to manifest. And what is iniquity? Iniquity is a sin. Something, it's an, an unrepentant and remorseful sin. In our realm is when you, 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 you have a nature, you live in sin, you don't repent about it, you are not remorseful about it, a violation of the laws of God, but there is no consciousness of guilt about it. So this was like a settled desire that this is what I want to do. So before he even did it, judgment was pronounced over him. And I've had people ask me, Pastor, then, if the devil repented today, can he be forgiven? Remember, the, 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 the operation of the falling of Lucifer happened out of time. 
the judgments and all that happened out of time. It's creation. The world lives in time. The universe lives in time. So once the time elapses, we will enter into the timeless timeless, whereby time does not count. So the judgment was an eternal judgment. So right now, all of us are programmed in time. So when time elapses, that judgment must come to pass. And so that's why if he repents, he will be repenting in time. But his judgment was done out of time. And, and the, 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 the face or the frame of grace that was available for him to repent then, he never took advantage of it. In fact, you look at the attitude in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter number 12, I believe from verse 7. The Bible says there was war in heaven. Meaning that after judgment, Lucifer, war, began to fight. Now the motive of his heart was revealed and the status of his heart was revealed. And now this became, now this is how now we begin to understand the origin of evil. Because after that motive now, whatever was his in heart, the rebelliousness and all that coming to set a parallel kingdom that is anti-God, anti-Christ, the whole spirit of anti-Christ. Now that is exactly what he's doing. That's the agenda right now. And that's now it's beyond moral inclination is a spiritual force of implementation. The war, the war began in heaven, but the Bible says, woe unto you earth, because the accuser of our brethren has fallen. So the war never ended, and now he's waging war against the sons of God. And, and for me, uh, you know, it's, it's quite intensive. But the abundance of your trading, now you see that um, iniquity was a perfect being until iniquity was found in him, and this became the source of his judgment. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sin. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. So we see that again, there is duality of speech because the king of Tyre physically became very busy and he was a trade person. But again, the Lord is now talking about not just judging the physical king, but also the force behind him. Uh, and that's the Lucifer. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart has lifted up because of your beauty. You are corrupt and your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. Of course, you have to get the parallel, the duality of speech. Because also the king of Tyre mirrored Lucifer in how he operated and in how it happened. And also the judgment being pronounced is also in duality of speech. Because there was a mirroring of this. When this great king of Tyre fell, the kings gazed at him. We saw that in 27. All the kings that did business with him, they were terrified. And there's a place in scripture that says, the kings of the earth will meet with Lucifer because they were deceived by him and they will be surprised to see that he's also suffering the judgment of God. Because there are those who thought he's the one who runs the world. There are those who thought he's the one operating and running everything globally. But they will be surprised in the day of judgment when they find Lucifer in the very place of judgment. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities. By the iniquity of your trading, therefore I brought fire from your midst, it devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. Literally, when Babylon showed up, there was serious destruction upon this particular you know, town. And of course, this king who operated as a dummy god, uh, because of his pride, uh, because of his pride, became the reason why the people were being judged and also the judgment was taking place in the territory. So that's why it's called your sanctuaries. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities. The resident place was considered as the sanctuary of the king. Remember, he, he, he considered himself as a god. He had a seat. And so wherever he even dwelt, this might be considered as a sanctuary. Please don't lose the, the, the conversation because there is duality of speech here. 
We are dealing with the judgment of a physical king, but this king also mirrors Lucifer. And the bigger picture was the foundation of Tyre and the concept of their operation and civilization was highly sponsored by the devil. So the Lord must deal with the king physically and also pronounce judgment over the force that is behind the throne. All who knew you among the people are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. So there was judgment in the city of Tyre. Of course, when the Bible says forever, it doesn't mean it will never rise, but it means it will never rise to its former glory. That's why today, even as I'm reading about Tyre here, it looks like a historical city. It's just in Lebanon. And the glory of that city is not as it used to be in those olden days. I mean, among, among I know there are people who join us for the Bible study and they work in these Arab nations. And I wish maybe one of them can send us a picture of uh, uh, the modern day tire because it's there just to see how the word of God becomes real. We are looking at, as you know, details revealed around 590 BC before Christ. Years, more than around 2,700 years ago. And the scripture that was pronounced then is now a reality in our day. And I bless the Lord because history is our best friend to prove that this book is not just another literature. Um, and so, as the city of Tyre was forgotten, so will one day the authority and the rulership of the devil will also be forgotten perpetually. So this is a dual judgment, dual conversation, and you must know there is a time where God is speaking to Lucifer directly. There is a time where God is now speaking to the human king. There is a lot of para, para, I mean mirroring of the of the of the language, and 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 you know it's it takes intensity of study to separate when he's speaking to the physical king and when he's judging the very uh, territorial powers that were there. And then there is judgment upon Sidon. Sidon was uh, a neighboring of Tyre. The word of the Lord of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward Sidon and prophesy against her and say, Thus says the Lord. Behold, I'm against you, O Sidon. I will be glorified in your midst. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I execute judgment in her. And I'm hallowed in her. For I will send pestilence upon her and blood in her streets. The wounded shall be judged in her midst by the sword against her on every side. Then they shall know that I am the Lord, and there shall no longer be a pricking briar or a painful thorn for the house of Israel from among all those who are around them, who despise them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. So the Lord is saying, I'm going to judge all the enemies of Israel. And Sidon, by the verdict of being a neighboring of Tyre, was also a very good friend of Tyre. And that means whatever the city of Tyre advocated, automatically Sidon also became a part of that. So their judgment was out of extension. All the nations uh, that were close to um, uh, um, Tyre, they began to face the judgment. Remember we began uh, from verse 25. There was Ammon, there was Edom, there was Felicia. And then there was Moab. And then we came to Tyre. Tyre has taken us quite some time. We will go to Egypt. And, and you know, uh, Egypt will also take some time. And, and, and these are the cities that were around to the north, the south, east, west that surrounded Jerusalem. And there was judgment upon all these cities. And the judgment was so that God can be glorified and God can be known in all the cities. And then the, the, the scripture ends with a future prophecy that says the Lord God, when I have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they are scattered and am hallowed or worshipped in them in the sight of the Gentiles, then they will dwell in their own land which I gave to my servant Jacob. And they will dwell safely there, build houses and plant vineyard. Yes, they will dwell securely when I've executed judgment on all those around them who despise them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. This is a prophecy of hope. Remember from chapter number four, uh, Ezekiel has been announcing judgments. And when we came to chapter number 26, 25, this was judgment of nations. And now 
at the end of 28, there is a prophecy of hope. That though Israel will land in Babylon, one day they will be restored in their land. And the Lord will gather them there. The Lord will fight all their neighboring enemies. And the Lord will establish them and they shall dwell in peace thereafter. And of course, there was the return from Babylon because they only lived there for 70 years. And there was the return from Babylon. And that return from Babylon became very significant uh, for the children of Israel. This prophecy was fulfilled. So at the end of the day, this became as an anchor of hope for the children of Israel that all was not lost. And um, God was going to restore them. Because any time judgment is announced, it is not supposed to show that God has become the enemy of people. In fact, even in rebuke, we need to see love. The Bible says, them that he loves, he chastises. Even in rebuke, we need to see the love of God. Anytime God moves even in judgment, it's not because he hates us. The same way, when a parent is spanking their children, they don't do that because they hate their child. In fact, they love them so much and they cannot afford to see them go astray. So we are done with the, uh, the judgments of Tyre. That's it from the town, the, from, 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 the, from the city to the leader, the king. And now we are done with that. Next we'll be checking on the Egyptian judgment. This is what pride can do to a people. For me, that's my take home message that pride is a real distractor and very destructive. Father, we bless you and we honor you. Though Lucifer was a creation of perfection, but iniquity because of pride was found in him, and he fell from a very glorious height and dimension. Tonight we are reminded none of us is special, O oh God. And dear Lord, it's my prayer that you'll search our hearts and we will also interrogate our walk and interrogate our lives and how we walk and even behave so that we may not find ourselves walking in self-glorification, self righteousness and also walking in pride. Thank you for this great reminder. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. So thank you very much uh, for joining us. See you tomorrow. Um, we bless the Lord for everything. And remember, it's time for us to give our offering and the giving details are there. 8017370 and 0726714713. That is what we use. And remember, every money, that's your donation for our high school missions. Otherwise, God bless you.